Hey everyone, this is Nick and welcome to the Linux and open source news show. This week we've got one major piece of news, which is the major outage that started yesterday and made millions probably of Windows PCs blue screen of death without really letting them recover very easily. And that was all due to a third party program that also actually runs on Linux but didn't crash Linux boxes for some reason. Who knows what that could be. We also have SUSE asking the OpenSUSE community distro to rebrand, change their name and change their logo to be, well, not as close to SUSE as they currently are. And we have a lot of other Linux and open source news. And we also have this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, your all-in-one platform to create, publish and manage your own website. Squarespace has really easy tools to make sure anyone can end up with a nice looking, well optimized website, no matter if you know how to code or not. Squarespace has what they call their blueprint system, which lets you pick from a variety of templates that are pre-built and will suit any type of website. And they even have the SEO tools you need to make sure your website doesn't end up in the last page of Google's search results. To go further, Squarespace has their own design engine to create your own pages. You can just drag and drop elements where you want them and you can change the colors, the fonts and just tweak the template however you want. And then you can add some extra features like creating your own online shop with a complete payment system. You can design your own logo from Squarespace, book your own domain name. So click the link in the description below to give Squarespace a shot and you'll even get 10% off your first domain or website purchase. So as you probably know, there was a giant IT outage on Friday, causing banks, TV broadcasters, airlines, train operators, hospitals, and basically every type of company or business or organization that uses computers to just stop working for a while. The Swiss Cybersecurity Office blamed CrowdStrike for the issue and it was then confirmed that the issue came from that. CrowdStrike being a cybersecurity firm that provides a product called Falcon Sensor, which itself provides real-time monitoring and protection from cyber attacks. And this thing seems used by a lot of major companies to try and protect their software and their servers. The issue seems linked to a misconfiguration or a faulty update in CrowdStrike, which basically made Windows crash on a blue screen of death and it just could not reboot easily or at all after that. It basically caused what I can only assume is billions of dollars worth of economic costs. More than a thousand flights were cancelled by various airlines, payment systems were down for hours, some hospitals couldn't work at all, even the freaking Paris Olympics games seemed affected. Now, there was also an outage for Microsoft 365, but we later learned that this wasn't specifically due to CrowdStrike. They had their own problems just as well. Other affected parties by the CrowdStrike problem included Visa, Amazon, the 911.gov website that handles emergencies in the US and more. Now fortunately a fix was found a few hours after the issue was first reported. You could just delete a file from the CrowdStrike directory in system32 slash drivers on Windows and it just stopped Windows from crashing all the time. The problem is you had to actually have access to the drive and if you were already in the blue screen of death configuration, chances are you could not do that without using some kind of live USB. Microsoft also said rebooting a PC 15 times would fix the problem, uh, which apparently it did for some people. CrowdStrike couldn't push an update remotely to fix the problem. Every system had to be manually fixed, which means hours were lost simply to make PCs bootable. And the real issue here is that there is one single system, CrowdStrike in this instance, which is deployed by 60% of Fortune 500 companies, by 8 out of the 10 financial firms and 8 out of the 10 top tech companies. It is a single point of failure that most major companies have in common and that's always a bad thing. And it is important to remember that CrowdStrike's tool works on Linux and macOS, but Linux and macOS systems just did not crash with that update. It's entirely a Windows related problem due to a problem with that software. And this raises two major problems. 
The first one is that one single system being deployed on so many computers that has access to that lower level operating system to the point where a faulty update will actually crash the entire OS, that's unacceptable. No program should have that level of access to any operating system. Second, how badly does your OS have to be designed if a third-party app can publish an update with one file and this makes your entire OS unbootable? Where are the fail-safes, the deactivation, the safe modes, the recovery partitions? Whatever, this is just unacceptable. I'm not saying it could never happen on Linux or macOS, I'm saying it didn't. Now, SUSE, the company behind SUSE Enterprise Linux, apparently asked the OpenSUSE community to stop using the SUSE brand name for their community distro. Now, apparently they have asked very calmly, very nicely, there are no threats, no deadlines. They just said, hey, you know what? We would be more at ease if you could just stop using the SUSE branding because it really links this community effort with our enterprise distro and we're not sure that's how we want things to go. There are still implications to this demand because obviously if the OpenSUSE community doesn't comply or drags their feet, chances are SUSE as a company might withdraw a lot of the support that they currently offer to OpenSUSE, including infrastructure and a lot of developer time. In the end, what SUSE wants is for OpenSUSE to stop using the chameleon and the SUSE name, which is reasonable. Fedora isn't called OpenRail, for example, or Open Red Hat. Having a different brand is acceptable, in my opinion. It's probably more of a Let's not let our potential customers think that OpenSUSE is just free SUSE Enterprise Linux kind of thing. This is also compounded by some worries about the governance of OpenSUSE, which apparently isn't super proactive. The board doesn't really meet often enough to address the issues a distro faces on a daily basis. It is apparently not structured well enough to handle this kind of stuff. Now, reading through the discussions on OpenSUSE's mailing list, it does look like a lot of prominent OpenSUSE community members are in agreement with this demand. Basically, the idea is, hey, you know what? Maybe let's not make so much drama about this and let's comply with what the community providing us with so many resources is asking of us. It's kind of a good common sense practice thing and they are within their every right to demand that. Of course, some people will paint this as corpo bad, harasses Linux community, but this is well within SUSE's purview to ask. It's their branding and it's their resources that they're lending or giving to open SUSE to help it grow. So I don't think there's any drama really around this. It's just a nice, polite ask from a company to its community effort. And it, it looks like it might just be followed. Now, Solus, the distro that rose relatively recently from its ashes, decided that they would do away with App Armor and Snaps. App Armor being canonical solution to add security profiles to various apps and programs. It's basically SE Linux that a lot of other distros use, but for Ubuntu. Solus developers decided to stop applying the App Armor patch sets to anything other than their current LTS kernels because apparently it's just too much work. And this in turn means snaps will be dropped in Solus as well because snaps heavily depend on app armor to run with solid sandboxing and confinement. And if you don't have app armor on your distro, snaps run with partial confinement, which is not as safe as snaps advertise themselves to be. Now the plan for Solus is to stop supporting snaps entirely in the future with users encouraged to move to flat packs instead. And it's not an ideological choice either. It is mostly because it is a lot less maintenance for the Solus team. The app armor patch set seems pretty gigantic with 60 individual patches that have to be applied to every single update of the Linux kernel, which might be very easy for Canonical and their developers, but it's probably way harder to do for a community effort that doesn't have that much manpower. It also means that without these patch sets, Solus can generate their ISO images on their own infrastructure, which apparently wasn't possible previously. So in early 2025, Solus will no longer support snaps and will encourage people to move to either the native Solus packages or to flat packs. It's not a giant distro with a giant user base, so it's not like, oh, snaps are dead. But it is an indication that slowly but surely, most distributions are siding with 
flat packs or with their own packages, and Snaps is slowly being just limited to Ubuntu. GNOME 47 has its first alpha out now. It's poised to be a big release with support for accent colors in the GNOME shell and libadvita apps, meaning that all your applications from most other toolkits will at least share a color. It can also now be compiled with Wayland only, although this will depend on what your distro decides to go with. Fedora will ship GNOME by default without X11, but probably most other distros will retain the X11 session in the install. GNOME 47 also adds support for VR headsets on Wayland with the DRM lease protocol. It supports hardware cursors, even with KMS drivers. It implemented the XDG dialog protocol to handle how apps display modal windows. The shell has been slightly revamped to better work on smaller or bigger display sizes, and GNOME software should have better performance thanks to asynchronous loading. GNOME 47 also supports persistent remote login sessions. You can also force the remote computer to not go into Hibernate when you're logged in to it remotely. GNOME Calls is now ported to GTK4. Web has a few UI improvements. And GNOME Tracker, the thing that indexes all your files and powers GNOME searches, has apparently been replaced with new modules that perform better. You can already try the alpha using the GNOME OS ISO. It's not a distro for daily use, it's just for testing. But it looks like it is going to be a pretty major release. Obviously, I'll cover it in a dedicated video. I think it's on the 18th of September that it's supposed to come out. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm pretty sure Feature Freeze is right before the beta stage, so we might see even more stuff landing in GNOME 47 before it has its stable release, which is pretty big. Now the Linux kernel 6.10 was released over the weekend. It adds a new system call called mSeal that can prevent changes to specific parts of the memory, which should help with improving security for certain applications. The first that really supports that and basically the only one right now is Google Chrome, but there are plans to expand that to other applications. There's a new profiling subsystem as well to let developers better identify potential memory leaks. The Linux kernel now also adds encrypted interactions with the TPM chips most recent computers have. So this thing can be used reliably and more securely. Networking performance should also be improved as well as hardware support with improved sound drivers for some Asus and Lenovo ThinkPads. Microsoft Surface Pro devices should now support fan profile switching and thermal sensors as well. There's more ARM support as well for specific laptops, improved camera performance and quality for Intel IPU and MIPI cameras. And we also have the usual P-State driver improvements for Intel and AMD CPUs, which should give better performance and better battery life for most people. There are also plenty of gaming hardware improvements for controllers, for handhelds. There's better RISC-V support and better Rust support in the Linux kernel's codebase as well. Basically, it is the usual big release with tons of improvements for virtually everyone. Now, depending on your distro, you might get the update immediately. You might already have it. Or you might never get it if you use the distro that stays to fixed kernel versions. Third-party repos exist for that, but use them at your own risk. And let's finish this with the gaming news. First, we've got a big update to PCSX2, the PlayStation 2 emulator. First, it should look much better because they have ditched the WX Widgets toolkit in favor of Qt, which is a good choice. SDL2 is now integrated as well, and this will let users configure controllers much more easily, even with auto-controller mapping. Plugins have been removed from the emulator for now, but they have added a library of pre-configured game fixes. You can also save per game configurations as well, and they added support for retro achievements. And who doesn't love throwing 50 chickens in the air and hitting them with a grenade all at once? That's always the kind of stuff you really want to do in a game, especially in an older retro PS2 game. Now, I'm joking, if you like achievements, that's fine. I don't understand you, but that's fine. And Wine 9.13 was also released this week, continuing the big rewrite of the command.exe engine, which might be very useful for certain install processes and for various post-install scripts that certain Windows apps use. 
For people who want to actually use the Windows command line on Linux, I don't know why, but you can, and they've also improved return codes for that. So the commands will actually tell you if they succeed or not. Wine also supports ODBC drivers for Windows, which is a driver used by a lot of systems that need to access databases. There were also 22 bugs fixed in this release, including for Photoshop CC 2024, Victoria 2, Guild Wars 2, The Witcher 3, Assassin's Creed Revelations, and more. And it kind of surprised me to see Photoshop CC 2024 on this list, because I was under the assumption that Photoshop just did not run at all under Y. But the bug report says that the app closes down and crashes after a little while, meaning that the app actually runs, which is very surprising. So I'll have to dig deeper on that, because my understanding was you cannot run any of the Creative Cloud suites with Wine right now. What you can run, though, is Linux on one of our sponsor's computers. Tuxedo Computers makes computers that run with Linux pre-installed. They are based in Germany, but they ship to a lot of countries in the world, and all their computers have hardware specifically picked because it works really well with Linux. And if in their testing they encountered any problem with the hardware, they actually submit patches upstream and they have packages in various repos, so you can install those fixes that haven't been upstreamed yet onto a lot of popular distributions. They have a wide range of devices that will cover every need and every price point with plenty of customization options. And honestly, they're all I use these days. I run the channel on one of their laptops. I do all my gaming on one of their desktops. They're just really, really good. And I haven't felt the need to even look at a computer that comes with Windows in the past five years. So if you need a new computer, you plan to run Linux on it, and you want to support a company that actually contributes to Linux, click the link in the description below and check out Tuxedo Computers. They're really, really good. Okay, so thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to leave a comment. And if you really enjoyed the channel, there are plenty of links in the description as well to do just that. So thanks for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.